Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is June 6, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 65. Wednesday afternoon, May 13, was a beautiful sunny afternoon in Rome. At the Vatican thousands of people were gathered in St. Peter's Square. They were waiting for the regular Wednesday afternoon audience by the man known to the world as Pope John Paul II. Right on time he made his appearance. As usual, he was standing in a special jeep-like vehicle, waving to the crowd as the vehicle drove slowly around the square. Inside the walls of the Vatican that afternoon it was a scene of peace and cheer. It was as if the insane rush of a troubled world had been locked outside for a few precious moments. Filled with a sea of smiling faces, St. Peter's Square seemed immune from the presence of evil. Suddenly the illusion was shattered. There was the sound of gunfire, and the man known as the Pope crumpled and fell. As the crowd looked on in disbelief, the Papal vehicle sped up and rushed out of St. Peter's Square. In a matter of moments the scene of tranquility had been transformed into one of tragedy. Gone were all the smiles, and in their place tears. For days afterward people the world over were asking just one question, why would anyone shoot the Pope? My friends, the answer to that question will never be revealed by the controlled major media. The Vatican has become just one more battleground in the secret war now raging worldwide. The stakes involve the fate of over 700 million Roman Catholics, one-sixth of the human race. The man accused of the shooting reportedly said right away that he had acted alone. As an excuse he said he was protesting against the turmoil in Afghanistan and El Salvador. Then there were reports, especially here in the United States, that perhaps he was tied in with the Palestinians in some way. One story followed another in rapid succession. Meanwhile the Italian police quickly found many clues that the would-be assassin Mahmoud Aja could not have acted alone. All the evidence pointed clearly to a conspiracy. In Europe conspiracies are known and recognized to be a fact of life, and so they are not pooh-poohed when they are discovered, but here in America it is different. We're treated like gullible children and taught that the legal word conspiracy is a no-no. We must never think that greedy, powerful men would ever work together to carry out their plans. My friends, there's a very good reason why we are never allowed to think seriously about conspiracies. The reason is that a very small, elite number of people are trying to control all the rest of us. There are an awful lot of us and only a few of them. The only way they can corral us and herd us around like sheep is to keep us ignorant of what they are doing. Keeping you ignorant is the very essence of their power. That, my friends, is why plots and conspiracies of all kinds are kept secret. And that's why the biggest conspiracy of all is the conspiracy of silence. It's a conspiracy to keep you and me in the dark so that the forces of darkness can continue unhampered. The one thing they fear most is the truth, known and understood by the people, because the truth is the sword of our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I live to know the truth, to understand the truth, and to speak the truth. I want to do my part so that the truth will continue to have a life of its own throughout our universe. I believe there is nothing more important than to look for the truth and keep an open mind to receive it, because without the truth people perish. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The Pope, the President, 
and assassination politics. Topic No. 2 The Aftermath of the Shuttle Columbia Disaster and Topic No. 3 Mounting World Crises and Accidental Nuclear War Topic No. 1 In August 1978 the Cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church were called into conclave at the Vatican. Pope Paul VI had died earlier that month, and the Cardinals faced the task of choosing his successor, a new Pope. From all around the world the Cardinals converged on Rome for the Papal Conclave. As they did so, the news was filled with speculation about the presumed leading candidates for the Papacy. Many were convinced that the Conclave would be a long one. Instead, it turned out to be one of the shortest Papal Conclaves in history. Voting by the Cardinals began on August 26, 1978 and that very same day there was white smoke from the Vatican. The Catholic Church had a new Pope. Vatican watchers were astonished at the speed of the Papal election. They were even more astonished by the identity of the new Pope. He was not one of the acknowledged front runners, but a complete outsider to the Vatican power structure. The little-known Cardinal Luciani of Venice had become Pope. Pope John Paul I. The following day, August 27, 1978, I recorded my AUDIO LETTER No. 37. In that report I gave a warning about the true significance of the stunning surprise at the Vatican. The atheistic Bolsheviks who have lost their former power in Russia will stop at nothing in their frenzy to regain that power. To that end, the Bolsheviks were launching a ruthless campaign to seize control of a tremendous weapon, the Roman Catholic Church. The Bolshevik goal was, and still is, to turn some 700 million Catholics actively anti-Russian. For the next few weeks there was no visible hint about the secret conspiracy which I had reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 37. Instead, Pope John Paul I quickly endeared himself to millions as the smiling Pope. Then came the shock of September 28, 1978. After a mere 33 days we were told that Pope John Paul I had died, suddenly and unexpectedly, and the man who succeeded him two and a half weeks later was another surprise. It was the first non-Italian Pope in 455 years and the first Slavic Pope ever. He was from bitterly anti-Soviet Poland, and his reputation was that of a man who stands up to the Soviets. On October 16, 1978, the former Cardinal Wojtyla of Poland became known as Pope John Paul II. The Bolshevik intrigues and maneuvering in the Vatican continued right on track. By late 1978 more and more of the pronouncements issued in the name of Pope John Paul II were anti-Soviet in tone. The public signs of rapid change in the Vatican were dramatic. Meanwhile, behind closed doors the forces at work were far more sinister and revolutionary than most people could ever imagine. I reported on these developments in AUDIO LETTERS No. 39, 41, and 42. The Vatican, my friends, had become the setting for assassination politics in the spiritual warfare between East and West. It had begun with the surprise election of Cardinal Luciani as Pope John Paul I in August 1978. He had been thrust into the Papacy by forces of which he was not even aware, Bolshevik forces. They intended to use him for transitional purposes to begin the anti-Soviet transformation of the Church, but he had turned out to be hard to manipulate into saying and doing what the Bolsheviks wanted. So the Bolshevik agents in the Vatican cut short the interim papacy of Pope John Paul I by assassinating him. When the next Pope was selected, the Bolsheviks made certain that his image was made to order for their purposes. When Cardinal Wojtyla of Poland 
became Pope John Paul II, it was only his image that the Bolsheviks wanted. The man himself was strong-minded and independent. He also had plans for restructuring the Vatican in ways that the Bolsheviks could not afford. To make sure that Pope John Paul II never carried out those plans, the Bolsheviks once again resorted to assassination. The preparations had been made far ahead of time, and they were carried out without a hitch. In mid-November 1978, Pope John Paul II, the most visible Pope in history, virtually dropped out of sight for a while. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 41, he was being poisoned, and on November 20, 1978, he succumbed. Immediately he was replaced by a Bolshevik look-alike, an actor, and the very next day the Vatican announced that the Pope had reappointed all of the top officials in the Vatican hierarchy known as the Curia. The Vatican restructuring, which had been planned by the late real Pope John Paul II, was snuffed out. The Bolshevik actor Pope then proceeded to make maximum use of the anti-Russian image of the man he had replaced. Doing exactly as he was told, he was stoking up bitter feelings toward Russia in heavily Catholic Eastern Europe, and most of all these bitter feelings were being encouraged in Poland, the most heavily Catholic of all. In AUDIO LETTER No. 42 I was able to make public where all this was intended to lead. The Bolsheviks were trying to make Poland explode against Russia in an uprising to be known as the Pope's Revolution. It was to be triggered during a Papal visit to Poland in May 1979. The actor Pope himself was to provide the spark for revolution in a way which he himself was not being told. At a critical emotional moment during his coming trip to Poland, the actor Pope was to be assassinated. When I made the details of the plan public in AUDIO LETTER No. 42, the momentum toward a Pope's revolution was building fast. But if there is one thing the Russians do not intend to allow, it is a Bolshevik revolution in Poland. Having learned of the Pope's revolution plan, the Kremlin directed Poland's leaders to take all possible steps to minimize the risks. Poland even announced that foreign journalists entering Poland to cover the Pope's visit would have to pay very high fees for the privilege. Meanwhile, Russian intelligence operatives went to work to undo the plan altogether. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46 I reported that Russia had finally succeeded in stopping the Pope's revolution plot. In early May 1979 the Bolshevik actor Pope was eliminated and replaced by a Russian actor, another double. Immediately the Vatican announced that it would agree to a one-month delay in the Papal visit to Poland as requested by the Polish Government. In that way a crucial emotional stimulus for revolution was eliminated. As I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 42, the original timing of the Papal visit for St. Stanislaus Day had been essential to the plot. With the threat of revolution averted, Poland then dropped its earlier demands for high fees by visiting journalists. A month later the Russian actor Pope, known to the world as Pope John Paul II, visited Poland without mishap. The Bolshevik plan for a Pope's revolution in Poland two years ago was thwarted by the Russians. But the Bolsheviks never give up in their agitation for revolution and war. Soon they were at work on Poland through another avenue, the so-called Solidarity Labor Movement, and at the same time the Bolsheviks have never given up on their dream of seizing control of the Roman Catholic Church. For the past two years the Catholic Church has been moving quietly in the opposite direction to that desired by the Bolsheviks. The man known as Pope John Paul II has initiated overtures toward eventual reunification of the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Churches. If that were to happen in the present circumstances, it would be an unmitigated disaster for the Bolsheviks. Catholics in the West and Russian Orthodox believers in the East 
would consider themselves spiritual brothers instead of enemies. Worse yet for the Bolsheviks, a Papal visit to Russia has been in the works very quietly in the Vatican. The Bolsheviks are determined to prevent that from happening, and as usual the Bolsheviks turn to one of their favorite political techniques, assassination. Early last month the Russian actor Pope celebrated a special Mass for new Swiss Guards. As if in a premonition, he warned them that they might be faced with giving their lives in their role as his protectors. A scant week later, inside the walls of the Vatican, he was cut down by the bullets of a professional killer. This time he survived, but as I said before, my friends, the Bolsheviks never give up. My friends, we are once again plunging into an era of assassination politics. For Americans, the shooting in the Vatican on May 13 created a sense of déjà vu. We had seen it all before, as recently as six weeks earlier, right here in our own land. It all looked horribly familiar, and no wonder. The Satanic forces responsible for the shooting of the actor Pope are the same ones who were behind the shooting of the President. These dark forces, as I have said many times, are the Bolsheviks. Having lost control of Russia, they now have a stranglehold on America's government instead. When news of the Pope's shooting reached Washington, reporters asked for reactions from the White House. The resulting National Television News reports that evening were very strange. We were shown only a still photograph of the President with the alleged, quote, I will pray for him, unquote. By contrast, we were then shown the Vice President talking with reporters on the White House lawn about the tragedy at Rome. We saw and heard seemingly heartfelt words of anguish at such brutal and senseless violence. It was the Vice President, not the President, whom we saw expressing the feelings most Americans wanted to hear. This is just one example, my friends, of a subtle but important pattern in our news these days. A sophisticated program of psychological conditioning is now underway directed at you and me. It is a disarming soft shell, but it is also using powerful subliminal techniques to ensure success. It's a program to build up the George Bush image in our minds while letting the Ronald Reagan image slowly recede. We're being prepared to accept it easily when the so-called Reagan era comes to an abrupt end soon. What's happening now is a preliminary phase in the plan which I first reported just after the election last November 1980. In AUDIO LETTER No. 60 I gave a warning that we would soon be told that the President had met with, quote, an unfortunate accident or a sudden fatal illness, unquote. Then we would see a change in the policies of the White House built around the image of George Bush. Just over two months ago on March 30, this plan of the Bolsheviks here almost succeeded on the first attempt. Outside the Washington Hilton Hotel, the entity President Reagan was led into an ambush, about which I will have more to say in a few moments. It was intended to cut down the President on the spot, just as several others were cut down. The assassination attempt did not succeed in that goal, but it was a partial success even so, because from that day onward the image of George Bush has been shining brighter and brighter in the public eye. First, the period of hospital confinement of the President was exploited. It was an opportunity to show off a restrained, statesmanlike image on the part of the Vice President. This image building began immediately during the first hours after the shooting. First, the entity known as General Alexander Haig rushed into the White House briefing room and seized the podium. His voice quivering with intensity, he announced, I am in charge here. It was a virtuoso performance, an act calculated perfectly to create headlines, furled brows, 
and a source of jokes for comedians. Stories of a power tug of war between Haig and Bush automatically focused attention on the Vice President in a favorable light. In contrast to the Haig outburst, the Bush entity acted humble and deferential. News reports said Bush refused even to sit in the President's seat in Cabinet meetings. The Bush image grew as a model of judgment and restraint. As the President recovered, public opinion polls were taken to judge what effect the shooting had on people. They found a dramatic rise in people's favorable rating of the President, but for the Vice President the improvement was astronomical from 31% to 69% favorable in just a few weeks, according to NBC. As I say these words, the subtle image-making is continuing. On Memorial Day almost two weeks ago, it was not the President we saw in news reports laying a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown, but the Vice President, and that same evening the entity Bush popped up again. Millions tuned in to a Bob Hope special that evening, and the closing act was none other than the Vice President. It was prime time exposure of the supposedly non-political kind that is most valuable of all in politics. Those who are building the image of George Bush before us by way of news guidelines are setting us up for things to come. What happened last March 30 outside the Washington Hilton was a warning, and we should not ignore it. It all began that day when the entity President Reagan emerged from the special VIP exit of the Hilton. The VIP exit is around the corner from the rest of the hotel. The hotel itself is many stories high, but the VIP entrance is set into a stone wall only about 15 feet high. At the top of the wall is a handrail with a walkway and trees behind it. In other words, the VIP exit from the Hilton comes out under a small park-like area. The exit itself is unmarked except for a concrete canopy extending out to the curving driveway. A good photograph of the scene appeared on page 30 of People Magazine for April 13, 1981. My friends, the whole idea behind the Hilton's VIP entrance is to provide security for important visitors. The natural and prudent thing from the security standpoint would have been to park the Presidential Limousine directly opposite the door at the end of the short canopy. That way there would have been only a few short steps from the door to the limousine, and that is how things are done by highly trained security forces. But, my friends, everything was done differently on March 30. Someone had arranged for the President to walk into a classic ambush. The limousine was not parked at the curb next to the VIP exit. Instead, it was parked at least 20 feet farther away, to the left, as the Presidential Party walked outside. The car was parked opposite a rounded corner in the stone wall which curves away from the street. Back around that corner, waiting to see the President, stood the press and various onlookers, including allegedly John Hinckley, Jr., and just behind and above them there were the numerous windows and balconies of the hotel itself. I have been informed by certain professionals whose business is the protection of VIPs that the pattern in all this is unmistakable. The President walked into the perfect setup for assassination, a crossfire. As he approached the limousine, the President became an easy target from two directions at once. One direction was the sidewalk above the overhanging canopy of the VIP exit. The other direction was from behind and above the press and onlookers, which included John Hinckley. In AUDIO LETTER No. 63 I quoted an early NBC television news report by Judy Woodruff. She had been with the Presidential Party inside the hotel and had walked out the exit. She had not rounded the corner to the area where Hinckley and the cameras were waiting, so she could not have seen Hinckley. 
That's clear both from her own eyewitness account on NBC and from replays of the videotapes. Yet she said, quote, I noticed there were some shots fired from an overhanging from a sidewalk that was above where the President's car was." Unquote. If you'll look at the photograph in People Magazine which I mentioned earlier, you'll see very clearly the area that Judy Woodruff was describing. It's not the area where Hinckley was. As for Hinckley himself, we are supposed to believe he did it all by himself. Always it's a lone assassin. Always he's portrayed as a nut. And always there's a note, left behind conveniently by the otherwise nutty assailant to avoid loose ends. We are also supposed to believe that Hinckley squeezed off six shots in only two seconds and hit four targets in that time. We're not supposed to think about the fact that every time a pistol is fired, even a small caliber pistol, it kicks. It deflects upward, spoiling the aim briefly. If that were not enough, we're supposed to forget about the bystander who jumped on Hinckley as soon as he started firing. Alfred Antonucci, a Carpenters Union official from Cleveland, had arrived too late for the President's speech, so he waited outside for a glimpse of the President. He was standing right next to Hinckley. On April 13, Antonucci was interviewed on ABC's Good Morning America by David Hartman. Hartman mentioned the alleged six shots by Hinckley, and Antonucci said, quote, Well, let me say this. He fired the first shot, and whether it was the second, the split second of the second, I was on top of him to break the aim." Unquote. Then on May 1, the New York Daily News published an interview of Antonucci. Antonucci is quoted as saying, quote, I hit him on the back of the neck as hard as I could and his gun, which he held with two hands aimed right at Reagan, came down. He kept shooting with one hand. I was told later by high authorities that four of the six shots hit the sidewalk." Unquote. My friends, we saw for ourselves on television the scuffle to subdue Hinckley as soon as he started shooting. Mr. Antonucci's story fits perfectly with what we saw ourselves, but we're supposed to ignore what we saw and just believe the official story that Hinckley fired six very accurate shots. Now suppose we do a little simple counting. On TV we saw four men wounded. That's at least four bullets. Four bullets also hit the sidewalk, thanks to Mr. Antonucci. That brings the total to at least eight, and from other reports at least two more bullets hit the limousine. That's a total of at least ten bullets that we know of. Hinckley's revolver, my friends, was only a six-shooter. Those who plotted the assassination attempt on March 30 are pulling all kinds of strings to cover up the truth. A perfect example of this was Time Magazine for April 13, 1981. The lies began with the cover itself. It's a painting, not a photograph depicting the moment of the President's wounding. It shows the President, viewed across the roof of the limousine, left arm raised, grimacing in pain. It is accurate except for one thing. You will see what is wrong with the time cover if you will compare it with the photograph I mentioned in People Magazine. On the cover of Time the stone wall is drawn as if it were a tall building. There's no hint of the overhanging sidewalk from which NBC's Judy Woodruff said shots were fired. My friends, we're living today in an Alice in Wonderland world. We're supposed to believe three impossible things before breakfast if that is what the controlled major media report to us. Only those who are determined to search for the truth will be able to see it in the days ahead. Topic No. 2. On Tuesday evening, April 28, millions of Americans tuned in their TV sets to watch the entity President Reagan address Congress. The speech was to build support for the Administration's budget, but most people were interested for a different reason. It was the first speech by the President since the assassination attempt 
nearly a month earlier. Many people were too absorbed in the dramatic reappearance of a wounded President to pay much attention to anything else. No one cared very much that the Space Shuttle Columbia supposedly arrived back in Florida that day, nor did many people give a second thought to the fact that it was a full week overdue. After all, as far as the public was concerned, the Columbia was a great success. We had seen it for ourselves on television. Based on one Space Shuttle flight, we are being told on all sides that we are once again on top in space. We are told that now we are five, ten years ahead of those poor dumb Russians. It would be nice if all those things were true, but unfortunately they are not true. In AUDIO LETTER No. 62 I was able to make public ahead of time the real mission of the Columbia, which was military. I described the plan for us to see the Columbia lift off from Florida, but to see a different shuttle, the Enterprise, land two days later in California. Meanwhile the Columbia was to have carried out a secret military mission unseen by you. The deception built into the original flight plan was bad enough, but as it turned out the flight of the Columbia ended very quickly in disaster, and you and I were supposed to believe otherwise. The secret disaster of the Space Shuttle Columbia and the television hoax which we were shown to hide it were events of great importance. That is why I have devoted my entire AUDIO LETTER No. 64 to giving you the details. The Space Shuttle Columbia is no more. The shuttle which we saw landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California was the Training Shuttle Enterprise. It had simply been relabeled with the name Columbia on its side. When the shuttle landed in California on April 14, we were initially told that it would be flown to Florida just a few days later, but as the days went by the shuttle just stayed there. NASA cooked up one excuse after another to explain away the delays to the public. Meanwhile frantic meetings were going on involving key joint military and NASA personnel. Things had not gone according to plan and they were not sure what to do. One faction insisted that NASA should go ahead according to the original plan. That plan called for a switch in shuttles between California and Florida. On day one a modified 747 would take off from Edwards Air Force Base, California with the Shuttle Enterprise riding piggyback. News cameras would be on hand to record the takeoff. The Enterprise would then be flown to its home base at White Sands, New Mexico. Meanwhile the public would be told that the 747 with the shuttle had made an overnight stopover. Then on Day 2 another modified 747 carrying a different shuttle would take off from White Sands and fly to Florida. Once again reporters would be on hand to watch the landing at Cape Canaveral. The new shuttle, of course, would have the name Columbia on the side just as the Enterprise does. In that way the Training Shuttle Enterprise was to be returned to home base and a fresh orbital rated shuttle sent to Florida. The switch would be made without the public suspecting a thing. In meetings behind closed doors about the situation, others protested that it would be foolish to go ahead as originally planned without more information. It was obvious that somehow the Russians had destroyed the Columbia, but the question was how? The Military Shuttle Planning Group agreed that they needed the answer to that question, otherwise there would be no way to devise countermeasures to give the next shuttle flight a better chance. Finally it was agreed all around that the first urgent need was to buy time. So NASA spokesmen were told to give the press a series of stalling stories about the post-flight shuttle procedures in California. Meanwhile every available avenue of intelligence worldwide was pressed to come up with an answer to that crucial question, what happened to the Space Shuttle Columbia? Day by day we saw brief news reports about the post-flight checkout of the Space Shuttle at Edwards Air Force Base. 
the shuttle was lifted onto the back of the 747, but the takeoff kept being pushed back one day after another. The Military Shuttle Planning Group was drawing a blank from their intelligence sweep about the Columbia. The shuttle stayed on the ground in California a week longer than originally planned, and still no answer came about the Columbia. NASA ran out of excuses for further stalling without raising unwelcome questions. The secret shuttle planning team was still in no position to prepare for a second orbital mission, and yet appearances have to be maintained. The United States Government is crowing loudly about the supposed stunning success of the shuttle because it is the only hope left for America in space. The Space Shuttle is the only program other than defense which has been given increased funding by the so-called Reagan Administration. Before the Shuttle Enterprise left California aboard its 747, the Shuttle Planning Group had to make a decision. Should they or should they not make the plan switch between shuttles at White Sands? There are three more orbital rated shuttles at White Sands, and a specific mission has been planned for each one. One of the planners summed up the dilemma in the words, and I quote, How can we send an orbital bird to the Cape? STS-2, 3, and 4 may require major modifications in order to get past the Russians. We won't know what those modifications are until we get the missing feedback on STS-1. I say send the Enterprise. We can keep it suborbital by faking an abort shut down one engine before press to Miko and let Enterprise return to Kennedy. That will keep Enterprise out of danger from Ivan. It will also keep the ball rolling while giving us more time to set up a successful orbital shot." Unquote. Someone else asked, What about the public relations impact? One thing we don't need is to abort a mission this early in the program. The reply was, would you rather lose another orbital bird to Ivan? Besides, if we do it right, we could end up with even more public support. You know what I mean. The idea that the shuttle is safe even if something does go wrong, and so on. There was a long silence followed by more discussion, but finally the suggestion was adopted. On Monday, April 27, the 747 bearing the Shuttle Enterprise took off from Edwards Air Force Base, California. The following day we saw the same shuttle, the Training Shuttle Enterprise, landing in Florida. There was no switch. The secret shuttle planners are still feeling their way. The plan could be changed, but as of now it will be the Training Shuttle Enterprise that rolls out to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral later this summer. It will look just like the Columbia did before its April launch, mated to a giant fuel tank and huge solid rocket boosters. NASA is presently shooting for the very early launch date of September 30, 1981. According to the present plan, the launch is to proceed smoothly for the first few minutes. Unlike the Columbia, the Enterprise will not veer north toward the kind of orbit forbidden by Russia. Then one engine will shut down prematurely. It will be earlier in the flight than the point at which contact with Columbia was lost last April. Then, as we are still watching on television, the Enterprise will return for its alleged emergency landing at Kennedy. By now the Enterprise has made so many computerized landings that NASA has confidence that the landing will be made safely. There will be an uproar about the aborted space flight, but it will not last long. Aided by the controlled major media, NASA will convince most Americans that the safe outcome of the supposed emergency is what counts. It will be said that this just proves how reliable the Shuttle really is. By staging an aborted Shuttle mission this fall of 1981, the Joint Military and NASA Shuttle Team will be buying time. They will not be expected to launch another mission until early 1982. By then they are hoping to have learned what they must do to get past the Russians into space. Topic No. 3. 
When news of the presidential assassination attempt here in Washington flashed around the world last March 30, it triggered an old concern in many minds. America was caught in a vulnerable moment. Would some other country try to take advantage in some way? Most of all, would Russia decide to invade Poland? At that time headlines were telling us that an invasion might be imminent. As it turned out then, our worries were unfounded. Russia had made no move toward Poland. Instead they were in the process of cooling down the latest Solidarity Labor crisis. Likewise, other nations around the world generally acted with restraint following news of the shooting. That is, all the world's nations except one. The lone exception was Israel. The timing could not have been more precise, my friends, if it had been planned in advance. As the first shocking bulletins of the shooting flashed across America, Israeli warplanes were starting their engines. As White House spokesmen were gathering to brief the press, Israeli fighter bombers were gathering over Lebanon. Through the afternoon and evening we Americans huddled around our television sets for the latest word from George Washington University Hospital. Meanwhile Lebanese villagers were huddling in basements and bombed out shelters as Israeli missiles and bombs exploded all around them. On the BBC World Service and other shortwave radio news reports around the world, the sudden new Israeli raids on Lebanon that day were big news. Not so here in America. News of the Presidential shooting and its aftermath drowned out everything else. It was not until Syrian troops began making moves in response to the Israeli raids that Lebanon began to enter our consciousness here. Day by day the Israelis and Syrians lashed out at one another more and more, directly and through surrogates in Lebanon. On April 28, Israeli jets shot down two Syrian helicopters over Lebanon. It was big news overseas. Here in the United States, though, it was overshadowed by the Presidential speech to Congress that evening. It was not until the following day, April 29, that the Lebanon crisis received top billing in America's controlled major media. The Syrians had moved Russian SAM-6 anti-aircraft missiles into the Bekaa Valley of Lebanon. This was Syria's answer to Israel's downing of two of her helicopters the day before over Zahli. Thus the Middle East Missile Crisis was born. Another mounting crisis is the growing feud between the United States and Japan. Lately it seems as if Washington can't do anything right towards the Japanese. On the morning of April 10, 1981, the first attempt to launch the Space Shuttle Columbia took place at Cape Canaveral. It ended in failure due to a computer problem, but it was the top story that day here in America. It all but drowned out the news story that was number one that day in Japan. The previous day an American submarine had sunk a small Japanese freighter, supposedly by ramming it. Then the submarine had left the scene without making any attempt to rescue survivors. Worse yet, the United States had not even admitted the incident to Japanese authorities until 36 hours later. In the weeks that have passed since the incident took place, the episode has raised more and more questions in Japanese minds. The United States Navy issued a report about it which differs drastically from the testimony of the 13 Japanese survivors. The Navy report even puts the location of the collision three and a half miles away from where it actually happened. The Japanese want to know why. To this and many other puzzling questions about the incident, the Japanese are demanding answers, but they are not getting those answers. The supposedly accidental sinking of the Japanese freighter was only the opening gun in the Washington-Tokyo feud. Since then Japan has been rocked by one shock after another at the hands of the United States. American naval vessels have sailed through Japanese fishing fleets, cutting fishing nets to ribbons. Suddenly there are revelations that American ships with nuclear weapons aboard have been using Japanese ports regularly in secret. Secretary of State Haig canceled a visit to Japan. Even the visit of Prime Minister Suzuki to Washington recently backfired on him. He agreed to language in a joint communique that led to accusations in Japan 
that Suzuki was making a secret military alliance with the United States. The irony of it all is that Suzuki's troubles are due to the fact that he is resisting any such military alliance. The Bolsheviks here in America want Japan to rearm, to become the policemen of the Western Pacific. Suzuki's predecessor, Prime Minister Ohira, was ready to go along with America's Bolsheviks despite stern warnings from Russia not to. Then Ohira died suddenly a year ago, and Suzuki replaced him. Suzuki does not want to rearm Japan, and so America's Bolsheviks want him out of office. Japan has endured all kinds of shocks in recent months, but they all have one common denominator. They all have involved loss of face for Japan as a whole, and especially for Prime Minister Suzuki. In Asia, loss of face is a very serious matter. By using it as a political weapon, America's Bolsheviks believe they can bring down the Suzuki Government. Whoever follows Suzuki will have to talk peace for domestic consumption, but he will have to prepare for war if he is to get along with Washington. Elsewhere in Asia, Red China and Vietnam have supposedly recently engaged in very heavy border fighting with many casualties. Meanwhile, the so-called Reagan Administration is preparing to declare openly that it will sell America's most sophisticated weapons to Red China. The United States Government, my friends, has gone insane from the cancer of Bolshevism and is leading America from folly to greater folly. In Europe, too, there is turmoil at the hands of Bolshevik agents. The Government of Italy has just been brought down in a tremendous scandal involving a massive conspiracy of many of the country's leading citizens. In West Germany, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt is under fire from forces who want to undo the balance he has struck between East and West, and in France the Bolsheviks won a tremendous victory in the election last month. Until now, France has enjoyed a special relationship with Russia as well as with the West. The relationship has been one of trust, built up laboriously beginning with the late President Charles de Gaulle. But the new French President Mitterrand is working as fast as possible to change that. Mitterrand will try to bring France into the anti-Russian camp headed by the Bolsheviks here in America. My friends, crises large and small are multiplying all around us, and by and large they are not accidental. They are part of the deliberate war build-up strategy of the Bolsheviks here, which I made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 63. By turning the world into a cauldron of crises, they are setting the stage for Nuclear War I. The whole world is becoming like the uneasy Balkans just before World War I. World War I was set off seemingly by accident, by the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria by a terrorist. Today we are once again in the era of terrorism, assassination, and turmoil. Like World War I, Nuclear War I will erupt suddenly from an unexpected spark, seemingly by accident. But World War I was brought about deliberately, my friends, and the same will be true of Nuclear War I. All of this is not lost on the new rulers of Russia. Russia's rulers are convinced that it is only a matter of time until all-out war breaks out between the United States and Russia so the Russians are continuing to whittle away at America's ability to damage Russia. When the Space Shuttle Columbia took off on its ill-fated flight last April 12, a fleet of special airplanes were aloft to help track it. The United States was dependent heavily on its fleet of advanced range instrumentation aircraft. These are flying radar and communication stations known as Droop Snoots for their huge bulbous nose. This special airplane is a modified military Boeing 707 designated EC-135N. When they are not involved in space shots, the EC-135Ns also have many other uses, including the tracking of Russian satellites. There are only a few EC-135Ns, so they are all important. When the Space Shuttle Columbia took off last April, 
There were only eight of them. The Space Shuttle program is an indispensable key to the current war plans of the Bolsheviks here, and the EC-135Ns are crucial to the Shuttle program. On May 6, 1981, an EC-135N, nicknamed the Boss Hog, took off from its base at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. It headed east on what was to be a routine training flight. As the modified 707 flew eastward, it was heading for an unexpected rendezvous. Hovering high over the rolling hills of western Maryland, a lone Cosmosphere was waiting for the Boss Hog. At 10.51 a.m. Eastern Time, the pilot of the jet radioed the words, Flight Level 290 to flight controllers on the ground. The plane was at 29,000 feet. Moments later the Cosmosphere fired its charged particle beam weapon downward at the jet plane, passing miles below it. The beam blasted a hole through the top of the fuselage and another out through the bottom. Explosive decompression emptied the cabin of its air. The blast also set off a secondary explosion of some kind, turning the jet into a ball of flames. At the same time, control cables to the tail were destroyed, and the jet turned violently nose down. Instead of gliding to a crash many miles away, the ruined airplane dropped like a rock, almost straight down. Radar traffic controllers were startled to see the plane disappear suddenly from their screens. It was all over before they even knew anything had happened. On the ground eyewitnesses heard a boom, 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 and moments later a giant ball of fire came screaming downward out of the clouds. For ten more minutes small pieces of debris from the plane kept settling earthward for miles around. In any air disaster as violent as this one, the investigation usually extends over a period of months, but not this time, my friends. On Friday, May 29, just over three weeks after the crash, the Air Force quietly announced that its investigation was already over. They knew what had blown their radar plane out of the air, but they also declared that for the time being the results will not be made public. While the Air Force was still reeling from the crash of the EC-135N, it became the Navy's turn. Once again Russia's target was a highly sophisticated electronic warfare jet. The plane involved was an EA-6B Prowler based on the nuclear supercarrier USS Nimitz. On the night of Tuesday, May 26, the Nimitz was engaged in night landing exercises just off the East Coast. Carrier landings are always dangerous, and night landings especially so, but the EA-6B has a special advantage. It is equipped with an automatic carrier landing system to permit safe landings even in conditions of zero visibility. Partly as a result, the Prowlers are known as some of the safest of all carrier aircraft. But on that night of May 26, one of Russia's new Jumbo Cosmospheres was hovering high above the Nimitz. It was one of the two which I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 64, armed with a neutron particle beam. As an EA-6B approached the Nimitz to land, the Cosmosphere waited. At a critical moment of the final approach, the Cosmosphere fired. The invisible neutron beam instantly killed the crew of three and temporarily deranged the airplane's electronic systems. Beaten suddenly without guidance, the jet veered to the right and crashed into a deck full of airplanes. The toll, 14 dead, 48 injured, and 20 aircraft destroyed or damaged. It was the Navy's worst flight deck disaster since 1953. Day by day, my friends, the stakes are steadily increasing. The closer we get to all-out war, the more incidents like this we will see. Yet somehow we seem oblivious to the real cause. Our leaders are telling us that we have to act tough to keep the peace. Meanwhile, our supposedly tough actions are leading to the exact opposite of peace, NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. My friends, these days we hear constantly about something called national security. What does that mean to you? Can there be any such thing as national security without national survival? If not, 
then our national security hangs by a thread because our national survival is in dire jeopardy. Our leaders keep telling us that the threat to our security is Russia. Then while we are not looking, they turn right around and taunt the Russian bear. I have a last-minute report to pass on to you in this very vein. As you know, the supercarrier Nimitz entered port only very briefly after the fiery crash of the EA-6B. It entered port on May 28 and left again just two days later, May 30. The official story was that it was heading for the Caribbean for continued exercises. I must now report to you that the Nimitz was ordered to the north, not to the south. In a drastic departure from normal procedure, an American carrier group has been ordered into the Norwegian and Barents Seas right on the doorstep of Russia. This deployment is expected to be brief, but it is very dangerous. It is an insane act of bravado by the Bolsheviks here, like walking up to a bully and knocking the chip off his shoulder. Probably the Nimitz will get away with it this time, but one of these days we will cross that invisible line in the dust and the world will be at war. My friends, what is called national security today is a lie. The more we spend on national security, the less secure we become. True security can be built only on the foundation of mutual trust and mutual respect, and those things in turn can be built only on the truth. Those who secretly control America's destiny today cannot stand the truth. They are the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as He said long ago, they were liars from the beginning. We must seek the truth, cherish the truth, and pass on the truth to others. Only in that way can we break free of the satanic power that now grips America. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.